into your home on this 15th day of August 1999. What I mentioned is that because August 17th will be the uh, Earth Day of the Right Honorable Mark of the Sire Garvey, who we will be highlighting uh, throughout the next series of our shows. The, our show today is about Marcus Garvey UNIA and its impact. We have to understand that the Honorable Martha Zaire Garvey came to these United States in the year 1916 uh, after founding the UNIA in Kingston, Jamaica. Arriving here in these United States, he attempted to uh, meet with uh, uh, Booker T. Washington, but Booker T. Washington had expired by the time that he had uh, touched base here. Garvey arrived here, uh, landed in Harlem, New York, and from there he began to travel in and around the country, uh, covering almost two-thirds of the, of the United States. This way he had a hands-on, eye-view, uh, in touch with the situation that was developing among African people here in these United States. But just imagine, 1917, Garvey sat down with seven people and founded the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League of the World, 1917, in Harlem, New York. And within five years, this organization rose from seven people to six million. And, and some records even had them held as 11 million people throughout the world. Garvey and the UNIA had divisions in, in every continent, okay, and almost uh, every country. The UNIA had, had divisions not only in the Caribbean, but in West Africa, uh, not only West Africa, South Africa, East Africa, in the Congo. Uh, it had them also in Wales, uh, Zealand, Australia. Uh, anywhere that Garvey said that the black man is to be found, this is the way that he was to be organized. In fact, he even uh, he was the first one to say that if the black man was to be uh, was to go to the moon, uh, the Universal Negro Improvement Association would be organized there. Now, among that, in 1916 uh, and 1918 and through 1920, uh, the UNIA invoked the Black Star Line, Negro Factory uh, Company, Universal Laundries, and the Negro Factory employed people. The Black Star Line was not about uh, taking black people back to Africa, but it was about economic control. It was taking the raw materials out of Africa and the Caribbean and bringing it here to these shores of the United States. And we was then to return the raw materials and return it back to the continent. It seems that the European or the Western powers is, are doing the same thing as we speak today. Uh, 1920, uh, UNIA uh, in New York, for example, had three buildings, had one lot and two trucks, and had a weekly international newspaper called the Negro World. This Negro world was uh, sent all around the world. Uh, in fact, if you was in the French colonies or in the uh, English colonies, to be caught with this paper, could, you could either uh, be put in jail for life or you could be subject to death. This was the article, this was the propaganda uh, uh, paper that Garvey had. This was the paper, the Negro world now, that changed the Negro newspapers here in these United States in the 1920s because the newspapers prior to the Negro world was having lightning skin, you understand, uh, who shot, John shot Mary on Friday night and who did what to what on, on Saturday. 
when the Negro world came upon the scene, anybody in New York could read what, what was positive in Mississippi, anybody in Mississippi could read what was positive in, in South Africa, Cuba, all around the world where African people was at. So again, uh, it was the first step. Also, what the UNIA and the Garvey movement did was also have African legions. And the African legions were the military or the paramilitary force, but it was also the law enforcement uh, or organization of the organization and of the community. It was there to protect the community and, uh, and especially African women. Uh, also in 1920, uh, Garvey set out with launching a, a very serious program of starting of universities and education. In fact, some of the uh, organizations outside of the United States had schools that was feeding their children, feeding the students, feeding the people in the villages uh, with food and educating them. It seems that he had laid down the groundwork for future organizations and future leaders and for future achievements to carry on the real toll liberation of African people. There's more to come about uh, Garvey and the UNA and, and its impact. And today I have uh, two young men, and I, and I must say uh, they are very active in their respective organization. Uh, one gentleman, uh, you have probably maybe have seen him before because he was a guest on our show. and. I am all, always proud to invite him, and that's my brother Yao Yambo of the All African uh, People's Revolutionary Party. And then I have another young man, uh, a young activist that is now residing here in uh, Georgia, and, he, and you will hear more of him, and his name is Brother Malik Shabazz. Uh, a quaba to insight. A quaba. Quaba. Uh, first, you... Uh, Brother uh, Yao Yambu, uh, tell us about, uh, first of all, what your organization is doing and about the impact that Garvey has made upon your organization and yourself. Well, I think, you know, the, that could be a long thing, but I really started off with um, Brother Kwame um, Nkrumah, who uh, said that he had, had read all the great philosophers but the one who inspired him more than any of the great philosophers was the great Marcus Messiah Garvey. Mm -hmm. And we know that Garvey was a great Pan-Africanist, as you said, that uh, we had over 400 chapters throughout the uh, world. And we can see the inspiration of Garvey spreading through our people throughout the world. I think Nkrumah saw that Garvey uh, was a giant among our peoples and organizing our people and saw the necessity to make sure that the uh, UNIA and the Garvey Knights would never die by uh, incorporating the Black Star into the uh, flag of Ghana, mm -hmm. and also to name this ship line of Ghana, the Black Star Line, which still sail all the way from Ghana to Savannah, Georgia today. Oh, is that right? Yes. Okay. So mm -hmm. I think that uh, Garvey have made a great impact on all our people's lives. Um, you know, I just Kwame Ture used to always make a statement and say, you know, don't worry about me when I die because the longer one is dead, the greater they become. Mm. And we know kids who are 9 and 10 years old know about Marcus Garvey uh, today. Mm. And we know that Marcus Garvey passed in 1940. Mm -hmm. So Garvey had a great impact upon our life. I think Garvey is a person, no matter where you are, that speakers have to speak of them. Even on the uh, college institutions, when the speakers come to talk to the students, they have to mention Garvey. Just mention his name, give the students an inspiration to want to go to the library and know more about this African giant. Mm -hmm. And once they come to find out the great work that the UNI did upon the leadership of Marcus Garvey, then it shows the necessity of want to be an organization. And I think also, you know, the organization like the All African People Revolutionary Party see the necessity of keeping this giant alive by pushing organization, by doing events. And a lot of different organizations throughout the U.S. and throughout the world hold events on Garvey. Yes. Uh, Brother Malik. Yes, sir. Can you uh, tell us how 
the Garvey organization and uh, Marcus Garvey impacted upon your life and your organization? Well, basically, uh, for myself, uh, I visited Africa in uh, 1994, Ghana, mm -hmm. West Africa. And when I got there, I noticed that there was a black star in this flag. Right. And uh, I wanted to get some more information behind that. Mm -hmm. And once I found out that Osajifu Kwame Nkrumah had the star put in the flag as mm -hmm. a tribute to the Pan-Africanist vision of Marcus Mosiah Garvey right on. as a kind of a shining star to guide black folks from the diaspora back to Africa. It just intrigued me. Uh -huh. And it was at that point, once I got back to America, I wanted to join an organization because the impact that Garvey had on me was significant. Um, I would say I'm a brother that was influenced greatly by Malcolm X. Okay. Well, Malcolm <laughs> X's mother was a Garveyite. And father. Malcolm <laughs> X's father was a Garveyite. Right. Mm -hmm. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad was a lieutenant in the Garveyite movement. True. So it all stemmed from a common strain. That's right. And that's what got me motivated to be part of the solution and not be part of the problem in dealing with uh, uh, my people and uh, our liberation struggle. And so you represent a organization here. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us something about that? Yes, the New Panther Vanguard movement was formed in 1994, mm -hmm. uh, 28 years after the founding of the Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. And in our membership, we have former members of the Black Panther Party, as well as new and uh, older activists, mm -hmm. uh, older and younger students. Uh -huh. And uh, we're just carrying on in the spirit of the Black Panther Party. And I joined this organization really in its uh, infancy. And now we have uh, five chapters around the nation, uh, starting in Los Angeles. Uh, we've passed out thousands of bags of free food to uh, needy families. Okay. Uh, starting in South Central LA. Okay. Uh, we work with so-called gang members. And we okay, say so-called because uh, we know that the real gang is uh, the system. <laughs> so, uh, True. you know, we, we're really just involved in the community in all aspects. Mm -hmm. And we want to take the struggle to a higher level and we want to unite with brothers, like say from the All African People's Revolutionary Party, UNIA, mm -hmm. because we're going to take a united effort to bring about freedom for our people. I agree with you 100%. One of the things that uh, many of us, uh, Old Garvey acts always like to uh, put our fingers at is that as the UNIA and ACL evolve from an organization, it evolved into a movement. And why we say that it was a that it went from an organization into a movement because of the impact and influence that he had on worldwide worldwide people. Okay, it in fact had an impact on Europeans, okay, it had an impact on Asians, okay, and it brought to the world the plight of African people and Africa, you know, to the, to the forefront, where today we have organizations, you know, that are striving for representation in the United Nations, you know, on our behalf, which is right, okay, reparation. Uh, Garvey Head went to the League of Nations, and it was there that he, uh, he plead, he demand that they get out of Africa, okay, uh, that Africa be free, which falls in line with uh, some of the things that you, uh, brother uh, Yaya Yabu, your organization, have always uh, espoused as far as. Africa being totally free, the uh, the United States of Africa. But not only that, the movement uh, not only dealt with that present generation, but it was embedded that philosophy and that and and that uh, way of thinking, and whatnot, was I, I would say ingrained into the people, into the workers, into the average person, so that when the forces of the uh, enemy had sat down to crush the organization, they wasn't able to crush the will and determination of the people. And hence, we sit right here carrying on that same type of thing. So this, this is why we see that it was that movement. And that movement transcended, you know, we're talking about from 1917, here's 1999, and we're still going through the same 
frustration. First, first of all, uh, uh, Brother Yao, uh, your organization, believe uh, I, I will always say this, and if I say it a hundred times, I say it five hundred times that uh, you have, since I've been here, have conducted the uh, program for uh, Marcus Garvey. Uh, please tell us when and where it's going to be at. It's going to be on the 21st of August at Mosley Park, which is at 1655 Margaret King Drive here in Atlanta. The time will be from 3 p.m. to 8 p.m. And the speakers uh, that we have on uh, contact with yet, will they please come and uh, be able to speak and uh, have yourself present where our people can join your organization, where we can build this African United Front, which is the uh, theme for Af for Marcus Garvey uh, Day this year, is to uh, call to build an African United Front. And we need all these all African organizations to come out and uh, put their presentation before the masses and uh, call for the masses to come and join the organization where we can move forward. Thank you. Uh, and what time you say it's going to be? 5 o'clock? 3 p.m. to oh, 8 p.m. From 3 to 8 p.m.? Yes. And you are anticipating some live speakers? Right. Okay. And also, you know, we'll have uh, other entertainment, poetry, singers, bands, uh, Jicky and Stonefish Posse Band will be there. We're hoping the Steel Band will come out. We have a lot of cultural entertainment uh, for you. Uh, we would also like for some of the brothers uh, who do drumming to come out early and start drumming. We are big for some of the brothers from Ghana to uh, come out with their talking drums before the program to uh, okay. start yeah. firing it up. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, what's the title, what's the theme of the uh, program for this year? A call for our African United Front. A call for an African United Front. An African United Front. Yeah, because one of the things we have to understand the difference between of our, our political party and our movement. You understand? Um, a political party seeks the organization of the masses of our people to uh, build a government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In order to be able to build a government, then you must be organized. You must be an organization that is constantly struggling all the time to uh, organize our people to build this government. This government must be built in Africa. This government must be uh, built around our people's desires to be free. Uh, this government must be organized by the African masses. It's only the African masses that come to free ourselves and our land, no one else. So we come to beg our people. We come to plead with our people to come join some organization, start working for our people. As you said at the beginning of the program, that the UNI had a newspaper printed in three different languages. Yes, sir. Yes. So that shouldn't be a problem yes. today with all the technology yes. that we have. <laughs> we said we had over six million members in the UNIA. Mm -hmm. You know, that shouldn't be a, be a problem because we can see if we organize, then we can't employ ourselves. We can't educate ourselves. We can do everything for ourselves, you know. And uh, there's only two organizations that we will come to understand that. A lot of people say they love the people but don't work for the people. Right. But when you love your people, you work for your people. Mm -hmm. When you love your people, you want to know everything about your people. That's right. Just like you do if you you know, you got a boyfriend or a girlfriend, you want to know everything about them, you understand? Right. So yeah. right. we right. must want to know everything about our people's struggle. Okay. And that's why we have God today, where other organizations can come out and tell what are they doing in the sense of moving our people's struggle forward, mm -hmm. what kind of uh, problem that they are having and moving our people forward, what kind of help they need in trying to help move our people forward and to have membership for the Africans who want to come in and work for our people because how are we going to say, yeah, we love God, we love God, we love God, and don't come to work like God at work. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. You know, because that you mentioned uh, about the about the Negro world, one, one of the most important things that I found that was interesting about that paper was that, you know, we are talking about 1920, how, many, how was that paper was able to be circulated around the world? I mean, if you was in French West Africa, uh, all of a sudden the Negro world would pop up. If you was in South Africa, who the paper would pop up. And how that was available was because the merchant seamen, the merchant, the people that work on the ships, okay, uh, they wrapped the papers around their bodies, okay, and they carried that paper into these territories. And uh, as I mentioned before, if naturally if the colonial powers caught you, you know, you was in trouble. But the fact is that they, they got the word. 
And do you know that because of that, the ANC, it was in South Africa. Okay, now you saw their flag. Mm -hmm. All right, what is it? Green, Green black, black, and gold. And gold. Their flag, their colors, was taken from the red, black, and green. Okay? They had UNIA members, okay, that was affiliated with the ANC at that particular time. They read the Negro world, so the word got around. Today, we have all this cyber, uh, uh, what? Cyberspace, uh, you know, network and so forth, but yet we do not own anything because of the conscious level of the people even, even, even in 1920 you know if you call somebody african it was no big deal they know they were african they know they were working for africa they know they were working for african people it was no question about it right well no question about it now there's many questions about it our people are confused about who they are well yes why well, are you gonna be confused in 1999 and you straight in 1920 show that the cost of political education that we need as a people was not maintained. And we must maintain this political consciousness. That's why our people join organizations and have reading book lists where they read books that they leave in the club that make us more political consciousness, conscious about our people, about ourselves, what we should be doing. How are we able to do this and, and during the time of Marcus Garvey and the UNIA? Let's duplicate it. Let's study them and see how they carry out this method. We know that Marcus Garvey even before he came to this country, he ran newspapers. He worked for a lot of newspapers in a lot of different places. Yes. So he was conscious of writing. He was conscious of how to transport newspapers from one place to another. He, he understood, you know, about speaking, the, the people need to speak Spanish, they need to speak French. He know had contacts in these places. Mm -hmm. And as we gain, members, gain membership with our people in different places, there ain't nothing we can't do. It's only when we stay separate that we can't do anything. A footnote to that. Garvey, at the age of 12 years old, was in charge of men in the printing shop. That's right. He was born to lead. Okay. <laughs> he was born now, to lead. Yeah. you all know something about printing? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yes. You know that in back then, you got to be able to read backwards. That's right. 12 years old. You are a shop, shop foreman. In the printing shop. That's right. But his middle name was Messiah. <laughs> <laughs> and that gets directly to the point. He was born to lead us. That's right. And That's right. as you spoke earlier about the uh, the newspaper that uh, the UNI put out, mm -hmm. truth crushed to the ground will rise. Yes. Anywhere on the face of the earth, 196,940,000 square miles. That's right. And thing is, we are people that have lost the knowledge of self, where it's been taken from us, mm -hmm. and the knowledge of self is relative to everything else. And then, yes, once you get this information and this uh, history about your people, mm -hmm. and then you, you get this urge to want to struggle on behalf of your people, no one can stop you. And this is what Marcus Garvey has given to us. Marcus Garvey stemmed uh, from a common root where all black organizations today spring from. Thank you. But he affected all black organizations. Yes. Yes. And never forget the role of the CIA and the demise of the Honorable Marcus Garvey. Well... Um, and they, they, we're going to do a show on that. Yes, sir. Okay, we, we, have, we have some material on, on well, it, it was the forerunner of, of the CIA, mm -hmm. but it's actually what we're talking about, you know. Um, and America never still apologized to what they did to the other Marcus Mar Mar Messiah government. That's right. Out to this date, they convicted they him. They deported him and had no retrial, nothing, you understand? I mean, that... that that's where they got their blueprint on how to sabotage organizations. Because do you know that when they was about ready to free Garvey from uh, the penitentiary here, they held him up for a couple of days so that they can get their people marshaled and forces, and then he was supposed to have gone to New York, mm -hmm. and instead they shipped him out to uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. We got a call coming in. A quadra to insight. Oh, hello? Yes. Um, yes. I just wanted to make a comment that a brother, the brother Malik, I think Ishmael said earlier, mm -hmm. and it was a reference to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. It's not a big thing, but it's just a correction that he wasn't influenced or he wasn't in the Marcus Garvey movement. He now, wasn't? He, no, he wasn't. When he started the Nation of Islam, that was straight influenced by Allah himself who came to the personal master for Al Muhammad. And I just heard that mistake before, so I just wanted to correct you on that. Well, uh, okay, but let me tell you this. 
uh, it is a fact that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was a member of the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League. And I refer you to Race First, Dr. Tony Martin book. That's one documentation. Okay, I don't mean to cut you off, but I'll refer you to his brother, John Muhammad. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad was never in Marcus Garvey um, movement. I don't care if Tony Martin said it or not. You can ask his brother who's living okay. right now today, John right. Muhammad. He was uh, never in the Marcus Garvey movement. My, my call, you can go to the Schomburg Library then. Uh, I have talked with members of the UNIA that knew the Honorable Elijah Muhammad before he was the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. They said to me, personally, Okay, that he was a member. In fact, he was a corporal in the, in the Detroit division. And then when he went to Chicago, he became a lieutenant Detroit. in the Chicago division. Okay, and this has been documented by members of the UNIA that has served with him that I met personally. Thank you. Next call. Anyway, um, so... I would think it would be a great thing for him. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but like you said, with, like, with your organization feeding the people, yeah. I mean, feeding the, uh, you know, helping the uh, young people in the communities, yeah. you know, this was the thing uh, that Garvey was talking about. A call with insight. We got a call coming in. Uh, yes, sir. I would just... Uh, I mean, you're right, brother. Uh, the Army Elijah Muhammad was, uh, in fact, a lieutenant with the Garvey. I... In fact, that was the reason he left Georgia. He left Georgia with them. Uh, and I have an aunt who also was with that group who went to Detroit with the Garvey Ice. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, and thank you for uh, tuning in to Insight. Okay. Oh, she was going well. Sandersville, Georgia, right? Well, Jim Hammond, yeah. He was yeah. Yeah. Georgia. Right. right. I'm not sure what part of Georgia yeah, he was from, but yeah. From there, you know. And if anybody is out there that uh, would like to contact me uh, on on the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, uh, because at some future date we would like to do a uh, a show on him and on his impact. So uh, you can contact me at seven seven zero four one three two zero five two. Yeah. So we were saying about the, that community work that you're always doing. Yeah. Uh, well, basically, what we do is we, uh, as I said, we hand out free food. Mm. Uh, we have uh, classes in uh, in uh, culture and and uh, just a variety of subjects. You know, helping our people get land, bread, education, and then eventually they want freedom. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, we have a ten point platform and program, and we try to work on each point in a practical position or practical way. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been very successful. We uh, we're building real slow. We we're not the Black Panther Party. I want to make that clear to you all. Okay. But we carry on in the spirit of well, the Well, explain Panther. that to some of our... Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, we were organized by a few former members of the Black Panther Party, uh, as well as uh, younger, older activists and uh, students, uh, to basically carry on in the spirit, because there was a resounding spirit that was left in, uh, and not captured over the 20, 30 year span that the Black Panther Party was not in existence. Right. And so what we want to do is capture the spirit and serving our people body and soul mm -hmm. and uh there was no organization in my mind that was as uh as i guess you could say as you can see a panther or see the, you know you say the word black panther mm -hmm. you know people say oh my god okay they know what they're talking about right, right, but the thing right. is uh uh the spirit of the black panther party lives in, in all of us right and uh again that stems again from marcus mosiah garvey and uh his uh vision to be free and, well, yeah. yeah, each each generation has to have you know that particular entrance. Yes. And you know there you know there you have it. You know, and like you mentioned before, all the organizations um, have came around 360 degrees to almost in, impact some of their things. I've heard uh, some of my friends in the in the BCP, for example, uh, they have branches internationally now. Okay, we know that, you know, I mean, outside of the organization has them, we know the Nation of Islam has them, you, you understand. Prior to, in fact, 1950, uh, none of those organizations went beyond the boundaries of these of these United States. Okay, and everybody now is trying to jockey 
for a position on the continent economically. Okay, so we know, so so we can understand that. But let's talk about the future. What can we lay down so that our future generation can build on? You know, I throw it out to either one. Okay. Well, first of all, I think that, uh, you know, our organization, we focus on the college campuses because we say the students must be the intelligentsias of our people, so they must be the uh, first cadres inside of our party. Students, we say, um, come from all around the world, every crook and every cranny of among our community. And so if we can organize them into the All African People Revolutionary Party and arm them with the ideology of incrumism to raism and with the objective of Pan-Africanism mm -hmm. and the need for organization, then when they return back from wherever, uh, where they are gone from when they leave the universities, then they can go back and start organizing our people and they will speed up this process of uh, Pan-Africanism. Um, this is a method that uh, we uh, use to uh, speed up the revolution. We understand that uh, the students have all the resources that they need on the campuses to uh, communicate to our people throughout the world mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of different method, media methods. You know, we uh, know that they must study and uh, write papers. We say, well, if you gotta write a paper, whatever the subject might be, do it or something that's going to be uh, needed and appreciated and used for the African masses. Just don't do a paper just to do it, you understand? Do it something that uh, can be used for the masses of our people to move forward, even if it's in healthcare. Even as the brother said, you know, both our organizations, we work with um, what they call so-called gangs. But like he said, we know who the gangs are, you know? Right. Like right. we'll tell this gang, don't put down your weapons. Don't turn in your weapons. Because you have to while you'll find out who the enemy is and you have your weapons, you understand? But if you turn in your weapons and you come to find out who the enemy is, you know, then you ain't got no weapon to use on the enemy. So surely don't turn in your weapons. Don't care who they say, you understand? Right. Because they never turn in their weapons. They want you to turn in their weapons, you understand? Right. So we right. never turn in our weapons. So we have to be conscious of those types of things. So... Students, you know, like I said, you know, uh, in these days in society, yeah, we can understand, yeah, you students, y'all really have a rough time, mm -hmm. economically speaking, even to go to school, to get an education. That's why we say once you struggle so hard, don't go to cheat. Get a proper education because this education that you get is not simply yours. It's ones who sat in those seats. Yes. It's ones who gave up their blood yes. for you to sit in those seats to get yes. an education to move all of our people forward. Right. You know, not to go to school and... Well, you can go work for this company or that company and make big money and forget about your people. Want to move out of the community, never go back to the community to do anything to your people, no matter where your community might be in the world. And if you love God, then you can never be that way. Mm -hmm. We know, like the brother said, you know, we have a lot of different things. Like we have baby doll companies. You know, we created jobs for ourselves. God has said, the, the UNIA said we must turn over our money at least 13 times before we let it out of our community. And that's what they did. You know? They, they, so are we doing that today in 1999? Are we more conscious today about ourselves and our struggle in organization? Because when you got the masses of your people in the organization, then you can see a correct line of struggle mm -hmm. and also programs and activities. Mm -hmm. Like the brother said, you know, they were feeding people. Right. And if they get new Black Panther parties, mm -hmm. chapters. You know, new wings. Mm -hmm. They will start doing these same things. And as people join, then we can see the flow of our people moving forward. The different organizations right. doing whatever their objectives are. No matter okay. whatever the objective might be. Even the churches, you understand, must be pan Africanism. Most, a lot of churches even have some sons that were African or Thai. Yeah, you know, right. they identify with Africa. Right. You know, so we must come to identify with Africa. We saw the, the, in the UNIA, you know, we had bishops. In the okay. UNIA, of course. Right. you know what I'm saying. Of so, course, yeah. and, you know, our people are moving forward with the UNIA in every method of our life. In fact, it's, it's good that you mentioned that. Is that you didn't have a a denomination type of thing. That's so right. you could be a Baptist, you could be AME, I could right. be a Catholic, whatnot. We could all belong to the uh, UNIA. Uh, the restaurants they had a universal restaurant. That sounds familiar. Oh, yes. Universal restaurant. Yeah. Universal re restaurant one, two, and three. They had a universal grocery store. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they had one manager that would buy the food, would buy all the goods for these restaurants. Okay. Uh, they even had farms, farmers, farms, right? So they, out in the south, Midwest. Okay. They would get you, yeah, yeah, both with your truck to go south, pick up the uh, goods, produce, and bring it into the major cities. That's right. 
okay? Cooperative, employing people, okay? People was employed. You had over a thousand people employed in the UNIA in the early 20s just here in the United States, okay? He taught us to be an independent people. Right. We have a call exactly. coming in. Uh, a call with two insight. Yes. Call. A quabba to insight. A quabba. This is Brother Corey from Atlanta. How oh, are yes. How y'all doing? Oh, how fine. you doing? Yeah. I want to commend y'all brothers on an excellent show so far. Uh -huh. And I really just called for to make a brief statement as well as to piggyback on some of the things you all have stated. I think what will be important for us to, to come to understand is not only what the Honorable Marcus Garvey did, but who he had to fight to do it. I think what would be intriguing to learn is, like, I heard a brother talking about the Boule, uh -huh. a black male Sikh society started uh, in 1904 to fight Marcus Garvey last week. And I thought that it would be intriguing for us to learn more about that relationship of black men who helped pressure Marcus Garvey off the set. Because I had heard that these brothers were still around today. And I know that uh, one of the brothers mentioned about an African United Front. And I want to know who is it that actually helping to fight the African United Front and who looks like an African. I think those kind of things may be uh, even more pressing for if we're going to be successful, we may need to know the roadblocks we have to get through to be ultimately free. Hotep. Okay, Hotep. Hotep. And uh, thank you, Corey. In, in fact, uh, Brother Malik had mentioned, uh, I think, something about Garvey and the CIA. Yeah. Okay, which goes hand in ha hand with the boule because it wasn't, you know, the the enemies was within and on the outside. And those that were so within the organization or within the black community, you understand, uh, is uh, very important for us to be able to identify. And like I was just reading something in uh, Race First, we talked about this brother, I think it was Pickens or something like that. Pickens. Pickens, Pickens was a NWCP member. Then he switched over f with the UNIA for a, a say, minute. You understand? Oh. <laughs> you know. Uh -huh. And then he was the, uh, the the head runner when they had the program of Marcus McGarvey, Marcus Garvey must go. Right. Uh, say program. So he jumped. Uh, he jumped tracks. Uh -huh. Okay. And we also know that uh, the dubious. Uh, Input that the boys did, did at that particular time had a uh, die effect with Liberia. Right. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> listen, uh, that rubber plantation right now that Firestone uh, is on, uh, that had belonged to the UNIA. You know, so uh, we will be looking at all that, and like I said uh, earlier, we will we will be doing uh, various insights on the various phases of the enemies within and without, you know, so, so that's, you know, that's something, something important. But uh, getting back to our community and educating our young people, I noticed, though, that the uh, Board of Miseducation is continuing their job of miseducating our youngsters before they get into uh, colleges and, and uh, universities. Do you find that to be the same? Well, there's a whole saying, if a people won't treat you right, how can you expect them to teach you right? <laughs> it's a uh, trickle-down effect. It's systematic. This system was designed for the oppression of black people. Uh -huh. It was designed for the exaltation of whites. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if we try to work our way within the system, we're going to always have roadblocks. Well, let me, let me ask you this, because you you right there with uh, dealing with young people. Why, what is it that makes them not want to be uh, as serious or, you know, so determined for the future. Because we are basically lions of the effects of captivity. When you go to the zoo or the circus, uh -huh. you don't see real lions. You see lions under the effect of captivity. Mommy, you know, uh, a queen mother wolf. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, you know, a 130-pound uh, blonde-haired, blue-eyed lion trainer <laughs> can walk in a cage and, and uh, with a little piece of meat and a stick and get a lion to go in the corner. That's not a real lion. No, that's a lion under the effect of captivity. Of course you can't. Yeah. You know, so this is basically what ha has happened to black people. Uh -huh. You know, we uh, we basically just have to wake up to, we have to, each one has to reach one and each one has to teach one. Right. And that's how we get to stage one of our liberation struggle. Mm -hmm. And we have to teach it to the youth from the cradle 
all the way to uh, wherever. How are you going about dealing with it? I mean, you know, you face up. Hmm? You know, you are really, you know, you really dealing with them. I mean, you know, before we talking about Brother Yayambo, he's catching them at the university levels, the college level, level and whatnot. You are facing them before they get to that. That as well as the college level. Okay. Uh, we were, when we first started in Los Angeles, we used to go to Nicholson Gardens and okay. Jordan Downs. And this is some of the roughest so-called projects mm -hmm. in L.A. Mm -hmm. And the young children from seven, eight years old to the uh, G who was 19, 20, mm -hmm. and even the OG, which was 30 or 40. Mm -hmm. We don't have an age limit because our oppression doesn't stop at an age. So right. basically what we try to do, we try to reach all of our people, no matter what their age is, no matter what their religious philosophy is, no matter where they're yet psychologically, but we just want to help them turn that pivot point in their life to do something for our people and to learn something about self right. and then go on from there. Okay. Uh, Brother Yah, your organization has uh, been to the continent. Okay. Uh, you... Uh, in fact, I think he was one of the first organizations, man, to uh, come out of the continent, right? That was international, you know, from as a vice versa. Am yeah. I correct on that? Yeah. Um, Kwame, uh, Kwame Nkrumah and Siku Torre? Yeah, but I think they were just, you know, all shoots of uh, Marcus Masai Garvey and uh, of uh, seeing Africa as primary. Mm -hmm. um, there was hard workers for the African masses. I think uh, we can be unique just like them as a people. Right. I think that uh, we know no one man, no one woman can free the people. It's only the people can free the people. I think that if we become more disciplined like Kwame Nkrumah or Sika Ture or Marcus Masai Garvey, we become uh, more intelligent about our people's struggle and what we need to be doing who are our friends, who are our enemies, what are we fighting for, what are we fighting against. Mm -hmm. I think more people come involved in organizations than to call a call and uh, say, well, we need a program to talk about the enemies. If you and your uh, organization fight for your people's struggle, you know who's against you because you know uh, who's always opposed to you, whereas they be an uh, African organization and not an organization. Mm -hmm. But I'll say this to all African organizations and uh, to all the listening audience. Mm -hmm. Any organization has been no organization at all. True. Even in correct or bad organizations has been no organization at all. Mm -hmm. Because here in the organization, you learn organizational skills. Once you learn these organizational skills, you can apply these skills that you learn to help your people move forward. Okay, yes. So here, you know, a lot of people just say, well, I ain't going to join this, I ain't going to join that, you understand? And you cannot sit outside of an organization and know the organization. Holy you have point. to come inside of the organization to know the organization. Holy point. You made an a excellent uh, point. Uh, yes. Uh, a quality insight. Hello? Yes, my brother. My brother. Yes. I'm really digging what y'all saying this evening. And even the thing brought up about the boule. Yes. And all the secret organizations that tie in together to keep us back. Right. Um, it's going to be a summit here in Atlanta very soon. It's going to be called a G Summit, G for Game, so we can attract all the youth. And uh, we're going to ask a lot of significant questions. And we're going to come up with somebody that's going to like this torch again. Yeah. Like these brothers sitting out there with you, and you, I've seen you many times. Uh, you know, we know what to do about the economics. We really do know what to do, my brother. We know what to do about black on black crime and a whole lot of stuff. We just got to get a panel together, which we going to call a G Summit, where everybody going to get a chance to see who is who and, like, uh, the talent of the team, whether she male or female. I know the guy who came up with that. I know about him, but still, the fruit has not risen to the top because we ain't all seen yet. And so when we have a summit, all the youth going to be involved, and that's when things are going to change. We went to the Million Man March, and all this, nothing we gonna do gonna change anything if the youth is not really involved. When Jesse boycotted Nike, everybody kept wearing Nike. But if Master P and Snoop Dogg would have boycotted Nike, Nike, it wouldn't be no Nike. Really? So they the power at this moment. Right. We just gotta just give them their props. And when we get up there and ask them, 
valid questions that everybody want to know about teenage pregnancy, ages, crime, black on black crime, hatred, or domestic, there's violence between the police and what we gonna do about the situation, how we feel about them. Uh, there's people out here with answers, but the old head, the old people that's, you know, so-called running this system right now, they won't let the youth uh, 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 get in position. And they keep saying they gotta take this spot, you know, and it ain't even about that no more. We need everybody. And so they're blocking out the youth, they're blocking out good games like y'all got. You can't go on no kind of with the old board, the old head members, the old Mason, the old Sprint. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And if I want you to come on the guard today, and if you don't get an opportunity to speak, maybe you'll get an opportunity to make an announcement about the G-Day. Because whatever we can do to help our people move forward, we need to give them the information. So. At least we'd love to invite you to come to get the information to the people to know when the event going to be and where it's going to be at and what time it's going to be at. And maybe you have some literature or something that uh, you might be taking membership so other people can get involved. Thank you. Yes. Yes, indeed. Uh, because they have a, a great platform for that. A cooperative insight. Caller, welcome yes. to Insight. Yes. How are you today? Fine. How are you? Fine. I would like to find out um, what part of Africa have you been to and uh, you were talking about the Marcus Garvey movement and which part of Africa did Marcus Garvey want African Americans to return to? Well, first of all, let's take the last question first and I'll share, and I'll share this information, um, this question with uh, I my guest. Uh, Garvey, Garvey never indicated